Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director of Cultural Engagement at Dallas Theological Seminary, and you have joined The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. And my guest today is Eric Willis, who happens to be on staff at one of the two churches I'm involved with in the Dallas area, uh, Bentry Fellowship in Carrollton. Eric, why don't you tell people your assignment at Bentry? My assignment at Bentry has morphed over the years. I'm currently the pastor of Minister Development, which is a cool way of saying that I oversee and supervise our pastoral launching pad, hmm. which is a 12-month residency of taking uh, pastoral senior pastoral candidates immerse them into ministry for a year and then launch them out into ministry. Oh, I actually didn't realize that was part of what you did, so that's cool. Yeah. 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 And that program's what, two years old now? That's correct. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember some of the first batch, which I know they've all been sent out and have landed somewhere, I think, for the most part. So uh, yeah. yeah. So that's good. And then uh, now, now the reason we've got you here is not to talk about that, but mm -hmm. another thing that you uh, commonly do, which is? I come alongside pastors who are experiencing burnout and conflict in church environments mm -hmm. and through a nonprofit I founded in 2007 called Reclaim Leadership. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you've done a lot of work with kind of helping churches either avoid blowing up or putting Humpty Dumpty back to together after Humpty Dumpty's fallen to the ground. Right. And unfortunately, I may have lit a few fuses along the way as well. Uh -huh. I, I don't know what I did. But yeah, but yeah I, I come alongside churches to help them recognize the conflict, um, figure out what to do with the conflict, and how to heal post-conflict. Okay. So let's talk about how in the world did you end up in this role where – because I know you've done a lot of this. Uh, mm -hmm. How have you ended up in this role? What was there something that precipitated it? You know, I do believe God has a great sense of humor. I hate conflict. Mm -hmm. um, I love reconciliation and mm -hmm. restoration, but it's the conflict part that gets me. Uh, so I was serving at a church as an associate pastor, and the church experienced some incredible conflict uh, inside uh, staff members, et cetera. Uh, ended up in a church split, and for anyone who's gone through a church split, you know the heavy emotional toll that it takes. And mm -hmm. even uh, some question their faith through the process. They question the church. They they question God. And there I was, um, having gone through an experience of deep conflict uh, to the point of. Uh, uh, concern over death threats and things of that nature. It mm. got serious. Mm. Um, and I took a little retreat with my family at the time. We went to Estes Park, Colorado, one of my favorite places in the world. And I said, okay, God, if you want me back in that environment, you need to make it very clear to me. And so as I was submitting myself to his word and, and studying and praying, uh, one morning I looked up and I saw a double rainbow. Hmm. And uh, I said, okay, God, you want me to head back? Hmm. And that was my promise, uh, hmm. to head back into that church environment. And for another year and a half, there was great uh, reconciliation and, uh, that the church experienced there after that split. Um, it was a few years later that my father-in-law, who lives up in Colorado, said, yeah, double rainbows happen all the time up here. Yeah. Uh, but I said, no, that, that's, my, that's my promise. But it, I was pointed to conflict um, through experiences of, of, of the church. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a PK, grew up a, a pastor's kid, and okay. I think my first uh, conflict coaching advice came when I was about nine, ten years old. Hmm. I remember uh, one Sunday morning after church, uh, we went out to eat, and uh, me and my little sister was on one side of the booth, mom and dad on the other side of the booth, and and uh, I overheard dad talking about the, the deacons that day. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, dad, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where I heard that uh -huh. advice. I no longer use that advice. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but it seems like uh, I've been surrounded by conflict and situations in the church uh, my entire experience. 
Now, if I heard deacons right, is that Baptist church background? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. And in, in, was it in Colorado or was it somewhere else before that? That was in Oklahoma. That was in Oklahoma. Yeah. So you've been in the South primarily in terms of growing up and, That's correct. and that kind of thing? Kentucky, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and here in Texas. Okay. So SEC country. There huh? you go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> anyone listening internationally has no, no idea, idea what, what we just was. went through. But anyway, um, so – so let's let's talk about how this happens, um, and and start off with kind of how usually. Well, let me say it this way: sometimes um, church conflict happens, and it happens suddenly, and boom. Hmm. And, and actually, it's probably been festering. My guess would be, right? But the explosion happens, and you're dealing with shrapnel. Um, but in a lot of cases, if people were sensitive, they could have known perhaps it was coming. Do you have uh, any kind of pointers or signs that tell you that, hey, this isn't just disagreement, there's something really serious that could be going on here? Yeah, there's a great litmus test that I like to, to use, and it's a question that I ask. Hmm. And that is, when you enter the church building on a Sunday morning and you see a particular individual. Can you sit shoulder to shoulder with them and worship God together? Hmm. Uh, if there's an angst in that, mm -hmm. then we need to explore something. Hmm. Um, because conflict organizationally is ultimately born out of the conflict in individuals. Right. And so uh, the litmus test is an individual process of determining uh, and allowing uh, God access to your heart to say where where's my heart today? So this is a this is a question staff people should ask about the other staff or is this something that goes across the entire congregation? Entire congregation, hmm. absolutely. Those who uh, believe in Jesus Christ, who have the indwelling uh, Christ in them, uh, have the potential for grace lived out, mm -hmm. and conflict can put a damper on that grace being lived out. And so it's a question all of us as believers need to be asking. Hmm. So um, uh, it's hard to know where to go next in terms of asking a specific question. Let me try it this way. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things get churches into trouble? Is it pretty wide open? Uh, pretty much. If you look at any organizational structure, mm -hmm. corporate, um, business, um, familial, uh, in every dynamic, you're going to have the same principles at play. Mm -hmm. Anything that causes conflict around us has the potential to uh, be a, co a conflict point in the church. Um, typically, uh, it is born out of an individual's desire to uh, go a certain direction with the church, uh, whether that's a leadership position or someone who is a high caliber volunteer who wants something done and it's not moving as quickly uh, as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. There's something that's motivating that individual to pursue a desire. And uh, you know, Scripture teaches us that uh, we have desires of our heart, right? And so what, what is that? The challenge, though, is to learn to delight yourself in the Lord uh, in reference to those desires. Mm. So a lot of conflict that happens in the church are actually born out of our desires. And the challenge is, and part of that litmus test, is to determine whether the desires of our heart are for our own benefit, our own comfort, our own uh, wants, or is it a desire to honor, glorify God in that. So you've worked in a lot of reconciliation situations where um, uh, I imagine in some cases you've been brought in because there's trouble and nothing's happened quite yet other than people are nervous and they know something needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And then I know you've been brought into situations in which the grenade's gone off and you're dealing with the shrapnel. So, right. so let's talk about both of those scenarios a little bit. Um, if, if there is – a church, and and you know, I'm I'm sure there are pastors who listen to us who, the the whole issue of uh, how they relate to their leadership is the rest of their leadership is a pretty important conversation. Uh, what let's let's do it this way. Let's start at the beginning. What advice would you give to pastors, or for that matter, to elders or deacons mm -hmm. about how they work together in leading the church that can help them deal with the conflicts? that inevitably come up when dealing with an organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, prepare your heart. 
uh, it, it starts with you mm-hmm. and what you bring to the table. Uh, if it's an environment where the grenade hasn't necessarily gone off yet, mm-hmm. uh, then I would consider that preemptive. Mm-hmm. And so what are the preemptive things necessary to make sure that there's no shrapnel? Uh, and that is starting with the individual involved, individuals involved. Um, and so I would say start at the heart, uh, prepare your heart, uh, understand other people's perspective. It's easy for us as leaders to know what we want and to know how to get what we want. It's a challenge for us to be able to pull back a little bit. Uh, we get so myopic on mm-hmm. what we want that we forget to pull back to see the eternal value uh, of the direction that we need to go or the input that we get from other people. So as, as pastoral and, and, and ministry leaders, we really need to pull back to see the eternal perspective. Um, and remind yourself that you can become myopic. And so a series of questions to ask yourself is, am I listening to other people? Am I allowing others to speak into this? And even more importantly, am I allowing um, myself to listen to what it is that other people are speaking into this situation? And by that, you mean really hearing. You don't just mean you know sitting there and being quiet while you're thinking about what the response is Absolutely. going to be. Absolutely. Okay. Well put. Yeah. Um, uh, wrestling with, you know, why does a person feel this way? Why do they view it differently than I do? That kind of thing. Not with a polemical edge on top of it, but really trying to get, have some, perhaps the word is empathy for what it is that's being said. Yeah, it's, it's a, the, the cliche, put yourself in the other person's shoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, allow yourself access um, to hear what the individual is saying without assuming motives behind it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's amazing. I just I, I was asked to write a piece yesterday for a new site that uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, a project that they're involved in that deals with creation and origins, hmm. in which there sometimes can be disagreements, as you can just, imagine. Just a little. And they asked me as a public theologian to address how to have this kind of a conversation. One of the first points that I made was. Um, Learn to listen to the other person without and keep it on the issue and don't get into motives. That that I, I say motives tend to be above our pay grade. That's it. And uh, and and so when we when when we attribute a motive to someone as a way of dismissing what they're saying, we actually shut off our ability to to be helpful in many ways. Yes, and you've also locked the door on any opportunity for potential. Um, holistic reconciliation restoration needed. Hmm. So obviously an important question. Let me ask you this question, because I'm sure someone listening says, yeah, but you know, conflicts exist in the church and you do have people who disagree, but but one side's right and the other's wrong. Oh, I love you know? That. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, why should I why should I give an ear to something that I know is wrong? Mm-hmm. And so the Apostle Paul says, why not rather be wronged, right? Uh-huh. Um, I, I love it when people bring that up because I always like to point out that uh, God's heart toward reconciliation and restoration has nothing to do with determining who's right and who's wrong, but it's all about what is right mm-hmm. in the situation. Mm-hmm. And so pulling people away from their agendas, mm-hmm. not to the other side's agenda, mm-hmm. but pulling them to a common ground of understanding what is God's purpose. To, what, and an attempt to have a real conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh man, this uh, there's so many directions. Let me let me let me give some examples. I'm gonna I'm gonna put some examples on the floor and ask you: Have you dealt with a conflict that deals with? Okay, and I'm just gonna All fill right. in some blanks. Okay, have you dealt with a con? Have you dealt with a conflict that deals with worship wars? Uh, contemporary or traditional music? Yes, yes. that's happened. Yeah, it has. And uh, um, and uh, is there a passage in the Bible that tells us uh, which style of music uh, we're supposed to be engaged with? The joyful noise. The Make jo- a joyful noise unto the Lord. Okay. okay? Yeah. Now, two of my favorite words are mm-hmm. define and clarify. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so when you see and read and hear, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, you have a filter for which that makes sense for you. That's true for the other individual as well. Mm-hmm. And so. 
when it comes to making a joyful noise, the contemporary stuff, the drums, the band, the guitars, that may not seem like a joyful noise. It's for noise, you. for sure. Yeah, no, that, just kidding. One, one, out of, one out of two is not bad, right? The, the traditional, the hymnology, the, yeah. all of this, the um, – the the softer side, if you will, the the more solemn, uh, reverent side of worship, is a joyful noise to some. Mm-hmm. And so, once again, the biblical principle that I challenge people to get on the same page with, to get off of each of their agendas, not to determine who's right and who's wrong, but to come to a place of what is right, is the concept of deferring to your brother and sister mm-hmm. in Christ. Uh, what would be the most loving and gracious thing for you to do? In, con- in, in, in uh, the concept of, of deferring to one another. Yeah, and I, I think in this particular discussion, if you think back and you ask, well, which of those mer- worship styles actually existed in the, in the time in which the Bible was written, the things that we're talking about, it does give people a little bit of a pause, opportunity to step back and say, all right, now what, what really matters in, in worship? Is it is it the instruments that are played or the beat of the music or the size of the volume or is it what we're doing with our hearts before the Lord as we gather together? That's, that's exactly right. That's the point. It's all about the heart. Mm-hmm. And I've heard uh, the arguments on both sides, uh, the contemporary worship um, pointing out that would you rather sing bar tunes uh, yeah. to, these, to these hymns or can we create new music? To uh-huh. And the point is, once again, not to grab an agenda and stick to it, but to come to a place of understanding that the purpose of worship is for God, um, and, and remembering that's crucial. Okay. Let, let, uh, I think what I want to do, rather than go on to a new topic, is let's just take this through the sequence. So, so you meet up with a church that hasn't split over this yet, but is in tension on this. In that situation, obviously, you're trying to have the kinds of conversations we just had about, Mm -hmm. let's step back and think through um, what we're really talking about here in some ways, and what's biblical and what isn't, what's what's cultural and preference and what isn't those kinds of things. And you're trying to get Mm -hmm. everybody to see that for everybody, is that? That's correct. Every angle on the table. Okay. Now. The other situation is you've, the grenade has gone off. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got uh, a division, and I imagine that what that adds is a whole other dimension to the conversation because you're now not just dealing with the issue, you're dealing with all the relational, relational. fallout mm-hmm. that has happened as a result, yeah. which of course is what you were trying to avoid to begin with, but sometimes you're there. Um, what is that process like? Painful. Uh, because people's emotions get involved with that. People are passionate about what they uh, determine are the the best way mm-hmm. and, and uh, the right way. And so uh, there are two issues at hand, the relational component and the substantive issue. And the substantive issue of what will worship look like in its, in its mode or model. And the relational issue is I can't trust you because you don't like – Uh, the type of music that I like. And so the challenge, uh, before the grenade goes off, uh, I mentioned it's preemptive. Uh In this case, it's redemptive. Uh And so the redemptive points are what I'm going to camp out on. Uh, What's God's heart toward you? What's God's heart toward this other individual? And it may be groups of people, Mm -hmm. and usually is. Yeah. And so – Trying to pull them together to see God's redemptive plan at work. Okay, so uh, uh, here's here's another scenario, and this is actually one I'm currently dealing with uh, more online and in private by email. You'd be surprised some of the emails I get about mm. uh, people asking for response and opinion. I've got. Uh, I'm going to change this up a little bit so that no one can figure out what's going on here, okay. but. I've got someone who's writing me an email who's very, very convinced that certain materials that are being used in the church uh, are not the right kind of teaching. And they can write pages in defense of this. Um, In the process, this person has probably uh, alienated themselves from a whole series of people, including the senior pastor of the church, several people on the staff, 
several people who run some of the Bible studies where these materials are involved, etc. That's not the only dimension that's happening. I just found out recently that um, this person is concerned about their children who are now thinking about walking away from the church now that they're at that age. Mm. And the first thing that popped in my mind is, I wonder how much this conflict going on in the church contributed to the fact that they are ready to walk away. I suspect that there are situations that you've walked into in which the dispute has been about that kind of a scenario where, where the church is going off in a certain direction and the feeling is the church's teaching is not in line with what I might expect or something to that effect. Have you had those scenarios as well? I have, yeah. Okay, so again, let's deal with the preemptive side first, and we'll probably come in. We'll probably hit a break before we can get to the other side of this. So let's deal with the preemptive side first. When you, when and, and really, this has many angles. You've got the person who's making the complaint. You've got the staff reaction to the complaint right. being made and all those dynamics. You've got the people who are executing the, the studies where this, this is this is one that's – it's like dropping a rock in a lake. It has ripples. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. And it's hard to determine which ripple is going to affect the next ripple and, and all that. So it's hard to forecast what – how right. far out those ripples will go. Um, Define and clarify, my uh-huh. two favorite words. Okay. okay. Begin with the individuals. You have an individual who is disgruntled or has a complaint or a, a, at the very least a concern about the direction the church is teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, a series of questions for that individual is what's motivating mm-hmm. uh, those, those concerns. Um, all of us have a filter, mm-hmm. and he is filtering his concerns through something. Yeah. Uh, concern for the truth. I have a concern for the truth. He wants the truth to be taught. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now let's define and clarify. When you say truth mm-hmm. and I hear truth, mm-hmm. I want to make sure we're on the same page. Okay. And so uh, as truth is your filter, what is determining the truth in which you're filtering? Oh, the Bible. Okay. okay. So God's holy word. Yep. So obviously you've heard something that contradicts God's word. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I just used a word that when people hear it, sometimes they need it defined and clarified. Okay. And so when I said contradicts God's word, what did you hear me say? And so it's asking questions like, like that, that. Mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. help an indiv- individual uh, see how they're filtering the concerns. So, But the point is we're entering into a dialogue in, in which part of the goal is to get the person to reflect on what they're doing, and I suspect one of the other steps is to uh, reflect on perhaps what they're not aware of that they're doing in the midst of doing it. Indeed. What's the goal in these questions that you're raising? We're looking for aha moments for that individual who has blind spots as to either what they're communicating or how they're communicating. Okay. Um, There's the potential for divisiveness Mm -hmm. um, when an issue like this uh, is, is presented. And so uh, the challenge for leadership is, once again, to hear, to listen, Mm -hmm. rather than react, uh, which is so easy for us to do, uh, the reaction part, not the the hearing. And so uh, the questions that are being asked of the individual with the concerns are to help the individual make sure that their motivation and their purpose in bringing this out is for an uh, an intrinsic desire for truth. Mm -hmm. Um, and if that's the case, then how it's presented is is critical. Mm-hmm. And so, providing um, providing some guidance to an individual who is dogmatic, and I that's a strong word, mm-hmm. um, and very sincere in what they believe is the right thing to do, and heading in that right direction, I would challenge them um, to. Define for me and clarify for me what you believe Scripture means when it says, speak the truth in love. Mm-hmm. What, what, what's that concept f- for you? Mm-hmm. And I would provide some coaching along those lines. What does it mean mm-hmm. to speak the truth in love? Well, believe it or not, the, the truth part we get really well. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like this individual gets the truth part really well. Right. It's the speaking it in love that, that is oftentimes missing. And so what I like to coach people to consider is to affirm the relationship, Mm -hmm. say what needs to be said, and then affirm the relationship again. Because Christ is foremost concerned about the relationship. 
He died for individuals. He didn't die for doctrine. Mm -hmm. He died for people, Mm -hmm. and he redeems people. So relationship is of utmost importance. And so that's why I ask people to affirm the relationship, which requires them to do a self-assessment on what they believe about that relationship and that angst that they may have in their heart. Can you sit shoulder to shoulder and worship with this individual? Mm -hmm. Is it really a matter of trust of the leadership in the direction they're taking the church in light of the truth that you want to share with them? Or is there something about you wanting to prove them wrong or see them fail? Or what is really at the heart behind what you're presenting. And as you present it, affirm the relationship, even if it is you acknowledge that they're in a position of authority over you in the church. Um, Speak the truth in love. Say what needs to be said. Affirm the relationship again. Uh, A concept of not allowing an incident to stand between an existing uh, relationship is is key. Now, I, th- this is a problem that once it introduces itself, there's what's going on with the person who registers the complaint that introduces the potential for division, and then there's the staff response to what's coming because obviously, it's kind of like a shot sent across the bow. Um, uh, here you are exercising. Uh, teaching gifts and teaching responsibility in the church, and someone in the church comes to you and says, you're not teaching the right thing, Um, what advice do you give to staff preemptively as they face this kind of situation? Bite the tongue and pray. (laughs) That's the immediate thing that you do. Hmm. Uh, An immediate response is oftentimes an inappropriate, inadequate, or wrong response. Hmm. And so bite the tongue, um, pray, and I I mean that sincerely. because it is going to be the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you to respond to individuals who get in your face and, mm-hmm. and, and, and voice complaints in what could be taken as a rude type of way. And then I would say avoid the, um, the pedestal syn- syndrome. Mm-hmm. Avoid placing yourself in a position mentally of thinking, hey, I've gone to seminary for all these years. Mm-hmm. I've got this degree. I know the languages. I've studied this. Uh, my blood, sweat, and tears went into this, and you're telling me that it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Okay, avoid the pedestal syndrome. Kick that pedestal out from under you, and acknowledge, and actually celebrate the fact that this individual desires truth. Mm-hmm. That's a healthy thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so bite the tongue, pray, discern Holy Spirit's prompting as to what direction you need to have the conversation go. Um, he may prompt you to to ask a simple question. Um, he may prompt you to to engage in dialogue, to to listen to points of contradiction. Um, um, so that would be the immediate counsel I would give: is to be available to listen. Um, but that's easier said than done, right? Yeah. Now here here's here's a dynamic that's happening in this situation that I, I think I'd like for you to comment on because I don't think it's all that unusual. It's what I would call the staff uh, passive response that has also an element of misdirection to it that then gets misread. So let me explain okay. what I what I mean. I think I think you probably have a clue, but let me. So the person says to the person issuing the complaint, "I hear you." I get what you're saying. We're doing something about it. Okay? Um, And then when they actually go to implement this in the perception of the person making the complaint, other than the correspondence that's going on between them, little or nothing changes. Mm -hmm. So what's communicated verbally to the person making the complaint is distinct from everything else that person is seeing going on in the community. That seems to me to be a recipe for potential problems. Absolutely. I hear you. I understand it. We're doing something about it. Two of those three are lies. Mm-hmm. Okay? We don't want to lie to our people. Uh-huh. All right? I hear you. I want to learn more. Mm-hmm. Let's discuss it. Mm-hmm. it. Is a much healthier process. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that series of questioning or, or statements um, will lend itself more toward the reconciliation side and agreement side 
than an antagonistic, uh, you didn't do what you promised me you would do type mm-hmm. of concept. Mm-hmm. Which is going to be the comeback, of course, is that mm-hmm. you told me you were doing this and I trusted you and now I don't see anything any different, so how, how have things changed? And you've just ratcheted everything up a level. And on the substantive issue, it's been ratcheted up, mm-hmm. and on the relational issue, your credibility is just deflated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, so it's a problem from that standpoint, and and I suspect that the reason I'm going into this in some detail is because in my mind the way these things progress is kind of, if I can say it this way, one misstep at a time. Mm. If I is that a fair yep. way to describe it? Yeah, one miscommunication, misstep at a time. And, and when that happens, as as if that builds up over time, all that does is build up pressure, and eventually. Um, something goes very wrong, mm-hmm. and, and and you lose it because there hasn't really been the kind of communication that you need as you move through this process to try and cut it off or or, or deal with it in a way that, that prevents it from from hemorrhaging. Yeah. Yes, that is the case, and then you have the explosions that take place, place and on the, the other end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now here's the other. Here's my other analysis of this particular situation. There are actually two things going on, and people tend to pay attention to one of them and ignore the other. Uh, there's the discussion about the truth that's going on all the way through this, and who's you know who's got this right, that kind of thing. Important discussion. Don't want to Absolutely. minimize it. Absolutely. Uh, but the other is what's happening relationally as this is going on, which my guess is most people pay less attention to when the discussion becomes a focus on what's the truth. And that actually is where the damage can get done in trying to resolve and move towards resolution. Fair? That's absolutely correct. Uh, very fair. And. Um, what happens is if 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 you have lost trust of me as a leader, um, and I am taking you or the congregation in a specific direction, and you have concerns about that direction, and I have not acknowledged or listened to the point of hearing mm-hmm. and engaged in dialogue about it with a surrendered, submissive, willing uh, spirit. Then what that's done in your heart has begun a process of of, um, hardening your heart against and toward me, Mm -hmm. losing trust. And if I could for just a minute talk about trust Mm -hmm. and the trust factor. I hear this all the time in Mm -hmm. almost every conflict I've engaged in. Mm -hmm. I can't trust them. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time with that statement because Mm -hmm. as I look at Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does it say put your trust in man. Mm Mm-hmm. It says, trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord your God, trust in God. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, we are to be trustworthy, Mm -hmm. but we are never to be individuals to whom people put their trust. Mm -hmm. We are always to point people to put their trust in Christ. And it's going to be that trust in Christ that's going to pave the way for reconciliation and restoration. So there's a coach, coachable moment and co- coaching opportunities to help people come to an understanding that if you're putting your trust in me or you're putting your trust in, in the leader, it's misplaced trust. Now let me tell you another piece uh, of, of shrapnel that I see from the scenario that I'm describing, and that has to do with, um, with children or young adults who watch this conflict unfold. So the major mm-hmm. players are the adults, obviously, mm-hmm. but there are children around this, and when they see this, my guess is, is that the impact on them is something also that's not thought about very much, and yet the impact on them can be potentially pretty profound. Oh, indeed. Life, life-threatening, life <laughs> uh-huh. life-changing. So the challenge is how to, once again, make your point Mm -hmm. without the fallout. Mm -hmm. And how to make a point without the fallout is to make sure that you have engaged the people relationally before you engage with the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, looking at your own family dynamic, uh, how this affects the family, uh, what is it that your kids are going to be influenced by? They're going to be influenced by what they hear from you, Mm -hmm. what they sense from you. If there is a, a, a root of bitterness because the change isn't being made, uh, that's coming out in your voice. It's coming out in the choices that you make to either attend service, not attend service. Uh, those are the factors that are influencing uh, that ripple effect 
um, influencing the children. They're they're picking up not only on what you say, but they're picking up on the the cues that you're giving because you're not getting your way or you're not getting your hearing. How you say it and everything else that comes with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so they have to internalize and process that. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a very good chance that those children have relationships in the church that that will they're cause tension and angst in them. Well, if my parents are upset at the church, then how am I to engage the church? And if the church is wrong, then what's my is my faith wrong? And what's this all about? And, mm-hmm. them, and it, it can really rock a, a child's faith. Yeah, well, and of course, that's why when, it, when a grenade does go off in a church because of a situation like this, uh, the shrapnel is literally all over the place. I mean, it's not just the staff or the principles that are involved, but all of a sudden people who may not even have been aware this was going on are pulled in and sucked into what's going on, right. and and the impact is is happening at, at multiple levels, and the stuff that we've been talking about just between the individuals now has expanded and, and exploded, if you will, mm. to involve people who maybe even before weren't even aware this was going on, and, and now the pressure to figure out which side am I going to fall on and that kind of stuff. You've got all those dynamics in place, mm-hmm. right? Right. And who wouldn't want to run from all that pressure? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, okay, so I've, I've kind of walked – we've kind of walked through this one in a little more detail. I think it's a sample of the way in which things build uh, and the way in which things can kind of unravel. Um, let, let's take a look at it from this way. How do you, how do you begin to stop – I'm going to call it a cycle. I don't know what else to describe it as, a uh, pattern maybe. Um, how, what can be done to, to diffuse the bomb mm. <laughs> that's building? Um, and uh, maybe we ought to talk about this from the individual side and, and then from a staff side and, and wrestle with, and then, and then we'll come to the, okay, it's exploded now. That's a different scenario. How do you put that back together? So let's do it in two parts. Um, how, do we, how do we diffuse the, the buildup in, in a situation if someone senses that's going – what's the uh, right kind of response? I mean, obviously we've talked about listening better and, and questioning your own motives and that kind of thing, but is there anything else we can do to add to that uh, equation? It's always better to ask more questions than the statements you make. Okay. Uh, I'm going back to the define and clarify. Okay. The more someone feels heard, Mm -hmm. the more clarification that's given to an understanding of where they're coming from, the the situation is deflated Mm -hmm. because they feel like they have made a contribution rather than uh, just voicing a concern. And so that's the challenge for the staff, is to allow the mindset shift that this isn't someone just spouting off a concern, um, but in the process, let's look to see how and if something that is being brought to our attention needs our attention for change uh, and being willing to take that. Okay, now obviously we've been talking about kind of a member-staff situation here. Another source of great conflict is within the leadership body itself. When when you've got either people within the staff who are disagreeing, or you've got perhaps even perhaps even more dangerous, your uh, your elder or deacon board and your and your pastor at loggerheads. In one sense, the dynamics it strikes me are the same, and in another sense, this is a different game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, because the players or, or those who are in conflict at, at, at this point, all of them have been given the responsibility to oversee the the spiritual health of the church, mm-hmm. and so that in and of itself brings a di- uh, a dimension a that's dynamic. not there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's a um, there's a heaviness with that. It, it's a it's an appropriate heaviness. Uh, but which means that we can't take this lightly. We can't mm-hmm. shove it under the carpet and move on. We have to deal with the situation, uh, and how we deal with the situation is is going to be reflected to the congregation. One of the questions I like to ask is is what's at stake? Mm-hmm. If if you as, as spiritual leaders of this congregation do not come to terms with what what you need to deal with, what's at stake? And I've heard answers from everything from reputation, credibility, uh, all, the, all the stuff that you would normally hear. 
but rarely do I get the the right answer. Mm -hmm. What's at stake is the witness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what's at stake when our leaders are in conflict. And that's what drives me to engage and help them see that this is a heart conversation mm -hmm. just as much as it is a hard conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, there are – your what's at stake raises two other questions that immediately come to mind. One is, uh, when do I come to the point of agreeing to disagree? Mm -hmm. And when do I come to a point where I say, um, I'm, I'm not, I may not be getting anywhere here, and it may be better for me to be elsewhere? How do you, how do you sort out mm -hmm. those? Because those are potential resolutions to decide. That's right. well, and, uh, and, and probably the what is state question, or at least an aspect of that might be, is it really – is this fight worth it? Okay, yep. so there are there are maybe three questions that we're wrestling with here. I'll try and keep them separate for you so that we can work through them. Okay. Okay. Agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. Going back to the principle of deferring to your brother and sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, agreeing to disagree can be done in two ways. Mm -hmm. It can be done uh, assuming the other person is clueless and will never come to understand what it is that you're trying to communicate. Okay. Or you can agree to disagree with an understanding that it's breathing grace into the environment, mm -hmm. that both of you are coming to an understanding. Even though they didn't budge, mm -hmm. you're breathing grace rather than laying claim. Mm -hmm. um, and so agreeing to disagree is one of those that you have to be discerning about. Mm -hmm. it's, there's, not a, there's not a litmus test for that. It's, there, there's not a way to, to, to really um, say, okay, if this, then this. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it, it's going to be the spirits moving in your heart to, to prompt you to be discerning as far as uh, deferring. Okay. The second one is what's at stake? And uh, it, it's making the decision, is this – is in some senses, is this really worth it? I imagine that's actually a very important question to raise pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be tied to the why. Mm -hmm. Okay, if what what is worth, uh, who's determined the value of this conversation, this dialogue, and the outcome? Um, it goes back to defining and clarifying terms and positions and understanding the other person's input and and hearing what they're saying. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to. Um, you're myopic. Mm -hmm. You're seeing what's right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to pull back and see the eternal perspective of what's going on in three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what significance will this conversation have on God's purposes for his kingdom? Asking that question in light of the discussion that's happening now will help you give that perspective of, of etern eternity. Which means that uh, an implication of that, it seems to me, is, is it might be important to wrestle with uh, the question of, which sometimes happens, is how quickly does this need to be resolved as opposed to worked through, which may take some time. Yeah. And that's where the substantive issue comes in, because mm -hmm. the substantive issues are going to be placed on timetables. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the, the things that you need uh, done, X, Y, and Z need to be done by ABC. Mm -hmm. um, the relational issues are the ones that are going to be time-less. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that's going to be developed. Okay, now the third one is, all right, um, this is not happening, and maybe the decision that I need to make is do I stay or do I go? Mm -hmm. Um, just I mean, the personal involvement with the church. Yeah. Do I stay or do I go? The answer is yes. <laughs> it's, it's one of those that, uh, once again, requires discernment of the Holy Spirit. And what I challenge people who are asking those questions, mm -hmm. and I never tell people not to ask those questions. That's a very valid question, mm -hmm. and they need to be processing that. But what I tell them is to go back to the motivation for why you're asking that question. Mm -hmm. If you think that you need to leave this situation because you're not getting your way mm -hmm. or you're not being heard or something of that nature, reevaluate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you sense that you you need to stay so that you can be the change agent and, and bring things to, to a head, to mm -hmm. bring it out, reconsider that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are so many variables that go into answering that question. Mm -hmm. And 90% of them are unknown variables. Mm -hmm. um, 
And a lot of times those decisions are made on feelings and perceptions rather than the truth and realities. Um, and so the challenge in answering that question is once again going back to discernment. Mm-hmm. Uh, if in the litmus test earlier, can you sit shoulder to shoulder and worship God in this environment, knowing what you know uh, about those that you work with, serve with, do life with? Well, Eric, uh, our time is just about gone. We haven't even gotten to the mm-hmm. rebuilding and reconciliation side of this, which is which given the kinds of things that can happen can be can be um, just as challenging and just as time consuming so I'm gonna hold you to coming back uh, at some point in the future and discussing kind of the resolution side of this because we've kind of analyzed how it breaks down pretty clearly and in, in, in using some examples that hopefully help people to catch the dynamics that sometimes may be going on that can lead to the breakup of a community that's not healthy and to have them pause and ask, what possibly can I do differently if I'm in that kind of an environment that might keep that cycle from from devolving to a point where it's destructive? And so I thank you for coming in and, mm. and chatting with us about this. My pleasure. Yeah. And we thank you for being a part of the table today and look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.